Go ahead, Rachel. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first seminar in our spring 2024 seminar series. Um, today, we're uh, getting a talk from Dr. Abu Youssef. Um, before that, I'd like to introduce the graduate student community leadership team, team for this year. Um, Roshan and I are the co-chairs this year. Our publicity team uh, is made up of Andrew and Avinash. Uh, we have a very large support team, and I actually need to update this. We're missing a few people on here. Um, that include Anir Bun, Swapnu, Maya, uh, Mohammed, Latif, Falani, Nurian, Suraj, Siavas, and Lewis. And then uh, we have our fantastic uh, mentor, Dr. Farouk Mistry. Um, we have currently our regular leadership team meetings on um, Wednesdays at 7.30. Uh, they're held over Zoom. If you would like to be more active in the graduate student community, uh, please contact either me or Roshan, uh, and we will send you the Zoom link for it. Um, the time doesn't have to be set at Wednesdays at 7.30. We do uh, set the schedule according to what the majority of our members can make. So we are also open to moving that if enough people want to. Um, if you'd like to become a member of our uh, group, uh, we have this uh, QR code that you can scan and join our Engage page. That kind of lets us know how many people are interested and uh, like good metrics on our membership. Um, I can leave that up for about half a second. All right. Um, we do also have a Facebook page and LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of decently fast, but if you would like to join those, um, the Facebook page has all of our events that are coming up. And if we ever post a video to YouTube, uh, we'd like to record our seminars. So in case you miss a part or you weren't able to attend a seminar you'd like to attend, um, we upload all of them to the YouTube. So yeah. Um, if you're on campus at OU, uh, we do have a team room. It's called the BERT team room, and it's available for GSC members. Um, it has couches, whiteboard, coffee pot, and microwave. If you'd like access to that, please email us, and we'll uh, get you access into that room. Um, just a reminder, uh, after I'm done with this, we'll be sending a, uh, a sign-up sheet just so that we know how many people attended and uh, what talks people are interested in going to. Um, so please sign that up once it's been linked. And then without further ado, uh, here is today's speaker, Dr. Abu Youssef, who is going to be giving a really relevant talk on ethical practices in research and publications. So off to you, doctor. So can I start? Yeah, please do. Okay. My screen is visible to you on? It is in presenter mode right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel, for your uh, introducing part. And I'm very grateful to the uh, graduate uh, uh, student professor? committee of a real quick question. Uh, you, we can see any notes that you have, so you might want to change the display setting so that it is a uh, full screen for everybody. Sorry. Um, the current display shows us the next slide and any notes you have instead of showing the full screen. Um, okay. So you may want to change the display setting. Just a moment. Yeah. If you go to display setting on the top and then say duplicate display. Yeah. The top duplicate. one right there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's okay? Yeah. Yes. That's perfect. perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And uh, sorry, uh, uh, I was giving thanks to the graduate student committee of Galibli College of Engineering and special thanks to the professor Farooq Misri who has given me this opportunity to uh, share uh, some experiences or share some views with the graduate students of the AM especially. <clears throat> so uh, it's actually the uh, it's a non-technical uh, talk and I believe that actually uh, all uh, graduate students uh, should know these issues actually, because sometimes it damages our life and it's really important. And I will show you some example and some uh, some news from around the world, actually how is 
uh, I mean, the impact in our life, the ethical issues in research and publications, particularly. So uh, let us first define the research ethics. Actually, uh, research ethics is, uh, is referred to a set of principles, values, and norms that guide ethical behavior and decision-making for academicians, scientists, researchers, and scholars. And research ethics seeks to address the moral challenges and dilemmas that raise from interaction between the researchers, publishers, fund providers, industries, communities, and nations across diverse cultural, economics, and the political systems. And it's actually a vast issue. However, today uh, 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 we'll focus, I mean, that we'll, uh, I mean, the narrow down the topics to some certain uh, areas. However, I would like to just focus some point on the academia because it is very important in academia. Nowadays, the inclusivity and cultural sensitivity becomes a very, uh, I mean, the prominent issues. Uh, since the inclusivity and cultural sensitivity ensures that academia, academia embraces and respects the diversity of students, faculty, and researchers, and it promotes the equal opportunities, right? So to ensure the equal opportunities, the ethical practice is a important issue. In teaching and learning, it involves, just a moment, Okay, so in uh, teaching and learning, actually, the it for studying the academic honesty, discouraging the plagiarism and the cheating, and ensuring that the assessments and evaluations are conducted with transparency and fairness. And you know, the uh, it's actually if the teachers or the professors don't follow the ethical values, then students' lives can be hell actually. And in publication practice, it has some uh, positive impact and the, as well as if you don't follow the ethical values or if you don't practice the ethical uh, uh, norms, then it can damage our life, okay? And it implicates ethical consideration in authorship, peer review process and responsible data management. So. I will discuss all the issues in detail in the uh, next few slides. However, the ethical issues is the much more significant in conduct of research when we handle the human being or the animals, okay? And because the uh, we have to ensure the participant consent and privacy and maintaining the integrity in data collections, analysis and reporting. Just a, a, a short example, say for example, if someone do research with the AIDS, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the nobody actually loved to uh, uh, explore or disclose his personal uh, identity, okay, in, in, in any sort of the report, any sort of the publications, right? So, just an example that how sensitive it is, right? Uh, I, I'll show you some example later. On. Now the point, what are the things that might lead to do some unethical behavior? The first one is the lacking of training. I think today is the, uh, the, the part of the training of the ethical issues. The ins insufficient training and awareness regarding ethical conduct in teaching and research can leave professors ill equipped to navigate the ethical dilemmas effectively. And most of the cases I observed in my uh, in my academic life that says for example for the engineering student, for the science students, okay, the the safety issues is, is comes first, right? It definitely it's an important issue. But when the uh, masters or PhD students start their research, they should be trained actually the ethical values. Otherwise, there is a high chance that, uh, I mean, the, uh, they, will, they will do some misconduct. And next one is the high expectations, okay? The, 
you know, the, we have some uh, competitions. Okay, how many papers? When the graduate students come together, maybe that is the uh, main uh, topics or gossiping topics. That how many publications you, you you published? How many papers you have? How many? This as for example, when the professor uh, uh, Farooq Misri is asking the good news, most of the comes up actually the regarding the the publication issues, right? So. Uh, sometimes yes, it's it's not uh, bad. I'm not uh, telling that the, the the competition of the good publication is is uh, always bad. No, but when there's some, I mean the uh, I mean the what do you call it? Some competition that makes someone actually the unethically biased that okay I have to grab something I have to show my I mean the potentiality those things actually the uh, 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 lead us to do some unethical conduct. And another one is the professional professional pressures. Say, <clears throat> this is actually the particularly when uh, someone, uh, uh, maybe most of you will uh, come to the academia, I mean, the lecturer professors, right? So in that case, the uh, uh, it, it, to be a tenure, uh, you, you have to grab some uh, uh, research grant, you have to publish some uh, uh, certain numbers of papers, and you have to guide some PhD master students, okay? So there are lots of pressure, actually, because uh, we have to achieve those goals within the certain times of time. So that's why sometimes this uh, pressure, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, the motivate us to, 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 to do some uh, or to violate the ethical values. The pressure to publish. There is a, a, a very famous proverb in the academia or in the research, the publish or perish. If you can publish, yes, it is true. If uh, someone do a very excellent research in his laboratory, even though it's very innovative, it's very novel, but if someone, I mean, he or she um, can't publish it, that, that means you did nothing actually in, in, in research, right? However, we have to publish the words, maintaining some rules and regulations, maintaining some values, maintaining some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, I mean, the research ethics, right? And last one is the ethical labs in person. This is much more important, actually. The ethics here, you see, that if we violate the traffic signal, maybe police will caught me, right? If we violate the financial uh, uh, rules, or if we do some uh, criminal act, maybe there are lots of agency uh, to whom we are responsible, we are accountable. But in research, actually, the there is nobody will, uh, I mean, the catch until otherwise it becomes a, a, I mean, a report or in a, a news, okay? However, if you, uh, okay, I, I, I'll I come it later. So ultimately individual ethical beliefs and values play a significant role in determining a professor's or researcher behavior, okay? So actually it, it will be developed in our personal belief and personal practice actually. So today, uh, basically, I will uh, focus uh, the ethical issues in research and publications covering the competing interests, the authorship, plagiarism, and simultaneous submissions, data manipulation, and salami slicing. So I will focus those issues actually in today's research. So, uh, so come to the first issue, the competing interest. Competing interest uh, actually uh, are defined as the financial and non-financial interest that could uh, directly undermine or to be supposed to undermine the neutrality, integrity, and value of research and publications. And financial competing interest, actually, uh, there are uh, sort of types, says, for example, the funding. Okay. So research support, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the each and every uh, PhD students actually getting their salary or getting their scholarships from uh, from uh, either from the university or either from the industry or from or or, or some uh, I mean the fund provider, right? So uh, if we don't follow the ethics in our research, then there is a high chance either we may gain or lose the financially. Okay, so I will show that due to the misconduct in research, how much was lost by the Harvard University? I will show you later on. And another one is the employment opportunity, employment opportunity. 
say, as for example, uh, while engaged in the research project, okay, say uh, one industry is providing your salary, right? And they offered you, if you can come some with a very excellent result, or if you can develop a certain uh, uh, materials, or if you can come up with a very uh, uh, impactful result, then we will hire you for my, for my industry, okay? In that case, there is a high chance the researcher will manipulate his data. Or to grab that opportunity, he or she may, I mean, that deviate from his principle. Okay, and <clears throat> another one is the personal financial interest. Sometimes, you know, the, uh, uh, though it's uh, not so regular, but however, it may happen in research. That is, say, you know, the, uh, the in, in, nowadays in open market system, there is a very competition between the, different uh, uh, business groups or different industries right so maybe one industry can can invest for 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 finding some lackings or the I recall it some some uh, some i mean uh, say as for example company x is producing a product and it has some uh, uh, some bad impact to the society bad impact to the uh, uh, the human body but people doesn't know that so if they uh, provide some fun to the researchers, so please re find out those lackings and publish it in, 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 in journal, then actually it, it, it helps the, actually the, you know, the, the other industries' uh, uh, reputations. So, uh, so far, so I remember in Maggie Noodles, uh, one research group, I'm not sure that any financial, uh, 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 I mean, the issues are related or not. It just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm giving an example. Uh, the, in some research group found the significant amount of lead in the Maggi noodles, okay? And when they reported in the journal, in the daily journal, even not in the research journal, in the daily journal, you can believe that the just next day, millions of dollars was lost by the mega industry. And I will show you an example. Look, this professor from the Dhaka University, okay, he identified some antibiotics in the packaging milk, okay? And when he published his report, and he was under threat actually, even while as he should be encouraged, right, that he has found out that, that those those packaged milk are actually not uh, suitable for the infant or the baby, right? However, he was under threat by the industry, even by the government. Okay, so those are the, actually the uh, impact of the uh, uh, financial competition. Okay, so another one is the non-financial competing interest, and. And that types of interest can take different forms, including the personal or professional relations with the organizations and individuals, academic competitions, and the, even the intellectual passions. So, as for example, a relative who works at the company whose product the researcher is evaluating. So, as for example, the OU have planned to buy a software, okay? And say, uh, 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 relatives of a potential professors of the OEU, okay, hired that person to develop the software, okay? If that software is not so much standard or it doesn't fulfill the requirements of OEU, still maybe it will be uh, uh, bought by the OEU. And in that case, actually, uh, I mean, the. Uh, why why it it, it 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 happened because because of the relationship with the professors and the inventor right so these things can happen and we call it the non-financial competing because of the relationships and the self-serving stake in the research agent uh, you know the being promoted in in, 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 in some positions, academic positions, say, for example, say you have to uh, uh, you have to have your PhD degree by this year and otherwise you can't be promoted, right? 
maybe in USA it doesn't happen, but uh, in other countries in the where actually non PhD are uh, becoming the faculty members, it, it is there actually uh, regularly happening. And personal benefit that are in direct conflict with the topics he, uh, he or she is researching. The personal ability, as for example, say the education ministry has taken initiative to include the sexual education in the uh, in the middle school. Okay, so the researchers who is conducting the uh, research, he has uh, he or she has some personal belief that the sexual education should not be introduced in the in that level. I mean, in the in the middle school level. Okay, so when he or she will present the data he will be actually the biased, meaning that the actual results will not come up. And now it comes to the authorship. It's randomly happening around us. An author, who should be the actually author? An author is generally considered to be an individual who has made a significant intellectual contribution to the study, right? And according to the, um, uh, it, it, this actually, it, this definition actually comes from the International Committee of the Medical Journal Editors, okay? And who should be the authors? So substantial contribution to the study, either maybe in conception or design, the data acquisitions or data analysis or the interpretations or the drafting, right? And even the, if, uh, 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 if, 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 I mean, the, if someone is the senior professors or the lead of the leader of the group, then maybe uh, he can do role as a final approval. Okay, still it is a contribution. I mean, the, he will give a look and he will okay. You can submit it. Usually the uh, supervisors, uh, 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 I mean, the, do this job, right? And other issues is the the order of the authorship, it sometimes it makes the conflict, okay? So who will be the first author? Who will be the corresponding authors? Usually this, uh, uh, this decision actually comes uh, from the group actually, I mean the joint discussions, who will be the first author and the, who will be the co-authors, uh, co okay? And where will be the positions? It's a very uh, common issues uh, around us. And I found some, uh, uh, some groups actually the uh, when the conflict arise actually or, or, or decisions uh, make some I mean uh, difficulties then the professors men uh, follow a rules okay the authors will be according to the uh, alphabetical order of their last name okay I found this uh, some research group practice these things the individuals who are involved in a study but not satisfy the journal's criteria or the authorship, then how we should include him or how we should be thankful to him, that we should list it as a contribute, or, sorry, in the acknowledgement, actually. We can say, for example, you are conducting a research, so you are using the some other slab or some other professor's lab, I mean, the some instrument of other slabs. So uh, if their contribution, you consider that this is the intellectual contribution, then you can include um, I'm the, that professor or the students as a co-authors, otherwise, if you think no, just uh, uh, they, they gave you the facilities, okay, you can use this instrument, no problem, okay? In that case, you can uh, mention their contribution in acknowledgement. There are uh, three types of authors that is unacceptable. We should know that actually. The number one is the ghost authors who contribute substantially but are not acknowledged. The, most of the cases actually in the pharmaceutical industry, when they handle the, in the big data, they actually hire the expert from the outside of the industry and they write the report on the publications. And nowadays I found the ghost authors can be, a, you know, the, um, uh, nowadays the, uh, the peoples are also, uh, what do you call it, the outsourcing. Okay, say there are some uh, marketplace in the uh, online, online, okay, where the people, even, even, even uh, some cases, the people are uh, supporting to write up the thesis papers. The, the, the someone is giving the data and uh, and uh, uh, some paid people are writing the thesis paper as well. Okay, so in most of the cases, even uh, 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 those people are, don't have the actually right because you don't know the, that person actually right even uh, sometimes uh, the uh, we uh, i mean the outsource the language editor right 
This is also one contribution. But we paid for that uh, job. And those are the, the, and the, those persons are treated as a ghost, right? So they though they have the contribution, but uh, we, we should not, I mean, include the as a co-author. And another one is the guest author who make no visible contribution, but are listed to help increase the chance of publications. Yeah, it happens actually. So there is a famous professor in that field. Okay, so you are trying to. Uh, I mean, the uh, getting his consent, uh, Prof. I want to include your name as a co-author. Would you please permit me? Uh, I will send you the uh, manuscript. Okay, maybe he will. Okay, uh, if you have the good relations or your professor have the good relation, then actually maybe he will uh, give you the positive consent. Okay, then we call we treated them actually the guest authors. He has no contribution, but for increasing the chance of the publications, the very good journal we included there. He's a uh, him or her. Another one is the gift authors, whose contribution is based solely on a questionable affiliation with the study. Okay, so uh, it happens. Say, for example, um, junior lecturer, okay, or the junior teachers, usually they, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I think I, I should say. It, uh, <clears throat> They, they put the name of the director, name of the dean, okay? Though they don't know actually what is going on, right? So we call them the gift author, meaning that we are actually gifting them, even they don't go through the manuscript, even they don't know what is the topics, even they know these topics is, uh, I mean, the, uh, have any connection with his background, I mean, the, his research background. Okay, so in that case, to, to get some academic benefit or to get some favor of the uh, higher authority, sometimes we include them. We call them the, the gift others. So there are some, uh, uh, oh, sorry, next one is the plagiarism. This is one of the most common types of publication misconduct. Okay, when one author deliberately uses another's works without permission, without credit, or without acknowledgement, then we call it the plagiarisms. And look, I'll go through um, uh, uh, some examples, but here, look, the University of Virginia expelled 48 students after plagiarism proof. And there are uh, plagiarism found in work of two DU teachers. Even the another university, they suspended uh, uh, teachers for the plagiarism case, and another university, two students kicked off semester, okay, due to the yeah the Ohio, uh, Ohio uh, University kicked off due to the plagiarism. So please be careful uh, uh, when you will write the manuscript or when you will write the uh, I mean the any assignment report or, and, and and so and so. So look this uh, uh, statistical data. In six years high, 27 undergraduate forced to withdraw from Harvard in 2021 due to the honor code. And look, the plagiarism is the one of the major issues, right? And exam cheating also another another issues. Okay. Now let's discuss since it's the very severe issues and it's uh, I mean the it's happened randomly in research. So uh, I would like to uh, discuss it a bit more. So plagiarism is defined as presenting someone else's work, your, your own by cutting and pasting, just cutting and pasting from others' work, okay? And quoting without quote unquote or any citations, okay? That means you are claiming that, you are claiming others' work as your own works, simply. And paraphrasing or summarizing, even you can paraphrase, I mean, you can change the language, but theme is the same, topics is the same, but still it's plagiarism. Using emails or tables or graph without a citations. And most of, uh, I mean, the, the uh, particularly the young scholar mostly, uh, I mean, the, uh, do this practice. Reusing own work, even, if you use your own work, this is also the plagiarism, okay? That is previously published and you are again, 
reporting your data or some table or some figures in your next uh, publications, still it's the resilience. Collaborating on what should be individual, okay. <clears throat> and most importantly, if you say, I forget to cite someone's papers, still it's plagiarism, okay? Now the questions, guys. I'm giving an example that this is the original source and this is the student's own work. Do you think is it plagiarism? Please response. I mean, I'd be happy no, to hear it. It is paraphrased, but there is no citation. Meaning that? Students work does not cite the original work by the- Meaning that is it plagiarism, right? It is plagiarism. Okay. Any different opinion? Okay. I think your answer is right. Yes, this is plagiarism because although the student paraphrased from the original source, a citation must be provided, right? And the text and the reference are at the end of their, okay. So since they're lacking of the reference, so it's plagiarism. So this one. Uh, no. Mm, this is not, but again, it depends because nowadays, I mean, since we are working mm -hmm. on a review paper, we know that mm -hmm. you have to, <clears throat> once the manuscript is accepted for uh, publication, you have to go to the author and ask their permission. And some of the journals give you few images for free too. So if we go into that, way, then yes, it could be. But in this case, it is properly cited to which paper it has been taken from. So it's not plagiarism. Yes. Yeah. In general, since it is properly cited, so it is not the plagiarism. Yeah, your answer is right. So the next one, this one, this is the article one and next one is the article two. What do you think? I mean, if article two is taken from article one, then it is plagiarism because it is not cited properly. The year of citation and the paper that they have cited is incorrect as compared to what the original source is. So it's a <clears throat> it's an improper citation. So therefore, it can be considered plagiarism. As a plagiarism, okay. Yeah. Anyone, please? Okay, so I think uh, your answer is correct, but we call it the self-plagiarism. Look, so this paper actually the same author, right? Same authors, but the, the article one was published in 2012 and the, this one actually he published in 2013, but the topics is same though, he rewarded the, I mean, the text, right? So we call it them, we call it as self plagiarism. Okay, now come to the simultaneous sub, uh, simultaneous submissions. It's actually the, it mostly happens in the young scholars, you, you know? So uh, to, 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 to publish very quickly, okay? So it's actually the, serious breach of the research ethics. Simultaneous submissions mean the duplicate publications. When an author submitted paper or portion of his or her own paper has been previously published to another journal without disclosing prior submissions. Okay? So this is called the duplicate submission. That means the Already you published your part of your works and uh, 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 I mean, the uh, you published one of your, uh, I mean, the set of your data and part of that articles you included in your second paper. Okay, this is called the duplicate publications and duplication by paraphrasing, we call them the, uh, what do you call it? The text recycling. Okay, this is also the 
duplications. So we should not do that. Even the translation of paper publishing in other languages also the, I mean the duplications. At the same time, the, we should not submit the same work simultaneously in the number of journals. Uh, why young researchers do this? Because if someone has some, uh, I mean the, uh, uh, I mean the requirements. Say, if you want to complete your PhD or the master degree, you must have comes up with the one or two publications. Then actually, the to make it faster, the young scholars easily easily do that. Look, the these issues, I I uh, uh, I found actually a proof. The, this guy actually submitted his papers. Look, uh, this is the editor's mail. We regret to inform you that this submission must be withdrawn since it came to the editor's attention that you have simultaneously submitted the same work to bioelectrochemistry. This constitute a fundamental breach of publication ethics. Okay, and not only that, I know this story. The when this research group submitted, I mean the simultaneous, I mean the two 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 different journal of the same public publishers. They were banned for the two years. That means that they are not able to submit those journals for the two years. Data manipulations. This is the another big issue. Okay. Data manipulation means the data that we are publishing or reporting that are not generated by experiment or the observations. So we divide it in two types, the fabrication and the falsifications. The fabrications means the making up research data and results on the table or recording or reporting them. That means you are not, uh, I mean, the doing the experiment in the laboratory. You are, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the writing the data for, on your table. Okay, that means without, I mean the field work, without observations, without experiments, when we manipulate the data, we call it the fabrications. And it's really, really dangerous. And another one is the falsifications, the manipulating research material, emails, data, or equipment or the process. Falsification includes the changing or omitting data or result in such a way that the research is not accurately re represented. Meaning that you say, for example, you have collected 20, uh, say 10 data, okay? So among the 10 data, you found that four data actually not in line, okay? So in that case, the researcher, what, what would they? Either they manipulate the data, that means they, 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 they uh, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, they write the data which actually make a very nice graph, or either they omit those, I mean, the, those data, the higher below or the lower below from the, from the trend, right? So that is called the falsifications. So even we should not do that. Even sometimes we manipulate the image, okay? So, uh, even we uh, sometimes we manipulate the process. So I mean the uh, uh, why it is uh, the, the the violation of ethics because the real uh, I mean the findings is not uh, reflecting from your table or from your data. And I will show you some consequence. Let's see the consequence of the data man manipulations and uh, the damage of the scientific integrity. If we manipulate the data, actually it can erode trust in the scientific community, okay? And it already happens. I will show you some, some interesting news. And misleading results, definitely. When you will manipulate the data, if the uh, other researchers want to follow your methodology, definitely they, they cannot, uh, I mean, they reproduce your data, right? And if based on your data, if some authority want to take the uh, policy making de decision, that means, uh, I mean, the, uh, that would not be good for the society, right? And another one is the retraction of research. Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's really dangerous, really, really dangerous and dangerous for your defame and uh, your reputations. Yeah? And uh, if, your manipulation is discovered after the publications, the researcher may be retracted and causing 
research may be detrict and causing reputational damage of the researcher, not only researchers, even the institutions. Okay. And legal consequence. In some cases, even data manipulation may be uh, illegal and lead to criminal charge. It, it, it can also happen because particularly if you, uh, I mean, the, it, can you remember uh, I showed some the the, the, the financial uh, uh, competing with the researcher, right? So if any issues come up that you are, uh, I mean, the, publishing the false data and if uh, uh, finally it comes that really you manipulated the data, then uh, I mean, the people can actually the, file a case against you. I mean, the legal action can be taken. The funding implications, yes. If researcher is found to be fraudulent or I mean, the, due to the data manipulation, the future fundings for the researchers or the initiative may be impacted, okay? So we have to very, very sincere in, in, in that case, okay? And delay in scientific progress, okay? So meaning that if we manipulate data, uh, I mean, the, a biased result is, will, will, will come up and the uh, improper result will come up. As a result, the, the scientific progress of the issues or the systems will be delayed, actually. Yeah. Another one, the, uh, uh, the harm to public health. Yes. If your research is related to the drug or the medical treatment, it can have serious consequence for public public health, even potentially leading to the ineffective or even harmful for the treatment, right? Even the life and death questions will come up. So look, the I'm not sure, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, many of you know this news that this year, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, the, this year means the 2023, the more than 10,000 research papers are retracted. This, this, this report is published by the Nature. Can you imagine? That means that the scientific community is questionable. When the general people will see that the research or scientists are, uh, I mean, the producing the false data, they're, uh, I mean, the publishing the fake data, then actually they will dishonor us, right? And if you see the how it impacts our reputations, the among the 10,000, 8,000 retraction by Hindi Journal. So, do you think that the, the, the journal reputations improved? They totally lost their uh, uh, name and fame, right? And people will be very scared to publish there. And the next data, maybe your, 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 your eyes will be blinked. Next, next news, look, the Harvard can say, uh, Harvard called for the retraction of 31 papers produced by Professor Anversen. 31 papers only from one's professor's labs. And the Harvard paid $10 million back to the federal funding agency. That means reputation lost, even the financial lost. And I will show you the another report or another case. Maybe your heart will be chill if you see that one. Definitely embarrassing. Nobel laureate retract non-reproducible paper in nature journals from the nature chemistry. The professor Jack. Even his colleague was unable to reproduce even in his own laboratory. His data was not reproducible. And finally, uh, I mean, the, uh, the papers are uh, retracted from the uh, nature chemistry. And last one, that is the, uh, I mean, the most worst case in the world so far, so I know, I mean, the, in the misconduct in research. And it shakes the Japan actually. Anyone know this story? Story of the Haruko Obokato, Obokata. Do you know anyone? Maybe no. Okay, so I'm telling you the stories. Uh, uh, Haruko Obokata, he was uh, doing PhD in uh, Riken Research Centers in Japan. 
and his professor was Sasai. Okay, he was doing research with the stem cells, and he published two papers in Nature Journal. Okay, it's it's not so so long before. I I think it is a twenty uh, fifteen or sixteen. Okay. And uh, the, the New York Times reported in 2014, yes, around that time. So the uh, one research groups were trying to uh, do the same research following his manuscript, I mean, the, following his papers, I mean, the methodology. So they were unable to reproduce the data. Then they noticed this to the Reckon Institute, okay? And Reckon Institute make a, uh, I mean, the investigation team yeah. And they allowed the Obokata that uh, we are allowing you one year to reproduce your result in your laboratory. And she was unable to do that. You know what happens lastly? His uh, uh, PhD was retracted. His, uh, I mean, the journal papers was uh, uh, withdrawn. And his professor, I mean, her professor, meaning that the professor Sashai, you know, the Japanese people are very sensitive. So she made a statement that being a supervisor, I cannot avoid the responsibility. And really his supervisor was shocked and, and drastically defamed. And uh, suddenly his dead body was found in the office. So sad incident because of the data manipulation, okay? The, maybe last one, salami slicing. So breaking up of segmenting data from a single study and creating different manuscript for publication. Say, actually the, the, the data you have or the result you have, actually uh, it should be, uh, I mean, the compiling in one single manuscript or one single articles, but somehow, you are publishing, I mean, the, in, in slicing your data, okay? So that is called the salami slicing. This is also the, uh, the, the violation of the research ethics. Now I would like to uh, mention the difference between the plagiarism and the similarity. Sometimes we mismatch uh, between this terminology. The plagiarism in, it means that when someone actually intentionally, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, I mean, the, copy from some other's work, right? That is called the plagiarism intentionally. But similarity, it actually the uh, commonly happen in research, okay? I mean, the uh, you, will, uh, you will use some common ideas and common informations, common language, right? There is a very high chance that your wording, your topics will, will match with, with similar with the other, other, other papers. But it is not, in, you are not doing it intentionally, okay? And, Yes, I mean, the intention means the definitely deliberately and unintentionally. Okay, so the consequence is that the already I showed you, right? The academic misconduct that can lead to severe penalties. And for the similarity considered as a normal part of the research process, maybe you will be asked to, to reduce your similarity or rewrite the manuscript like that. Okay, there is no penalty actually. The, and attributions, the lacking proper citations and reference, okay? And, but similarity, it, it's similar, but you properly cite it, okay? Then actually the, uh, the situation is normal almost, right? And uh, ethical implications definitely violate the academic integrity and ethical standard, okay? And in case of similarity, actually the, the encourage the build up on the existing knowledge and I mean, uh, improving your writing style, and so and so. So that is actually the difference between the plagiarism and the similarity. Similarity actually the it commonly happen in in research, so it's not the violation of the ethics. So last one is that actually, as I mentioned, actually which actually uh, I mean the enforce us or the which lead us to do some misconduct in research actually that is the personal faith and belief right so the my last word the love and continuous awareness of god okay and the day of the judgment enable man to be moral conduct and sincere in intentions with devotion and dedication 
in research actually that is the things actually which can actually guide us the morality the personal belief the personal morality uh, otherwise actually there is no police there is no there is no military actually to 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 to, to guard us to to i mean the to stop us from that uh, yeah, I mean, the ethical violations. Okay, Thank you so much uh, for your attentions. If any questions. I have a question if uh, yes. can be permitted. Sure, please. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. So I have a small question about, you said about the data manipulation and things. Mm -hmm. So if there is some paper published on some data that is actually taken from some experimental setup, mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, there could be some anomalies in the system or things, like the mm -hmm. paper is published already with the data found from the experimental setup and there are Excel files or softwares that have been used for taking the data. But Later on, uh, we found some glitch on the system, but the paper already published. Mm -hmm. What what kind of thing it could be referred to actually? Well, uh, Professor Farooq, would you tell something uh, in these situations? Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, we published something that was incorrect and we corrected it the moment we found out about it. And so the best answer I have is that if you found something is incorrect, you need to, to let the editors know and say, hey, look, we are sorry, this is the corrected portion. Yes, the okay. base, yes, I, th I think so, the, uh, that would be the actually approach. But the, uh, I mean, the, the based one will be the withdraw the papers, but it, sometimes it's not uh, looks good. But uh, as pro uh, 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 Professor Mystery mentioned, that yes, at, at least uh, uh, I mean the researcher should notify the editors. Then editor can take decision. Or sometimes you know there is the options in in in, in some papers that you can update uh, the uh, the uh, the tables of the data. Yes, yes, I got it. Yes. So in that case, you can update you I mean, the, in the published articles, actually. Some some journals give this opportunity. Um, I have okay. a question. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Please, Yusuf, you, you, yeah, you talked about salami slicing, but yes. uh, may, I, uh, may I probably discuss this? It's like, so each project depending on what outcome you're working on could be a very long to a very short project. So mm -hmm. I agree if it's a shorter project, uh, you, you may not want to slice your results, but if there is a longer project where each step of the project is a significant, uh, like it's a significant result that mm -hmm. needs to be published. Mm -hmm. And also provides the backing for the final, uh, final part of final the project. Outcomes. Final yeah, outcomes. Exa Do you still think that is uh, slicing? Because I, as a as a researcher, I am thinking any result which is important or which is significantly better than previously done experiments or anything that's in literature is mm -hmm. worthy of publishing. So that's how I'm looking at it, but. You can probably elaborate on saying that if a project is divided into many stages and each well, stage yeah, is yeah. reserved. Thank, thank you so much, Roshan. Your question is very clear to me. Yes, <clears throat> it's a very good question, actually. And uh, number one is that uh, there is some, uh, I mean, the space in the publication system for your case. Okay. okay. So, and, and you know, the when we get some uh, I mean, the fantastic result or some amazing result, so we have to actually publish as early as possible. Otherwise, maybe some other research group will claim the, I mean, the ownership, right? Right, right. So, yeah. So in that case, uh, until findings the concluding result, okay, yeah. uh, sometimes we need to publish. So in right. that case, I would like to suggest, or there is the scope in the publication system that you can uh, uh, write the manuscript part one and part two. Okay. 
So the title okay. should say part one and part two. Mm -hmm. and it part two, exactly, be... exactly. Okay. Okay. Then it then... is meaning that is the it is the continuation of your works. So okay. in that case, That's... it is acceptable, acceptable, okay. not the okay. slicing. Okay, got it. I understood. Right. Uh, can I ask one more question? Uh, sure, please. Okay, so so suppose I already published in some preprint version, like it was published as a preprint, but not the peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So there is some of my own drawn, I mean, a schematic diagram that was mm -hmm. in the preprint version. But suddenly mm -hmm. I saw the same kind of diagram in some mm -hmm. published paper of some other some other people, like. Uh, not published actually. That was also preprint, but that was published later after me. Mm -hmm. So how can I claim that that there was mine because I, I was publishing that thing pre before that paper actually, but I saw suddenly step into my eye that the similar kind of figure that I have drawn is on some other paper actually. Okay. So like so like, is there anything I can do for that just to claim that that is mine originally? If you if you drawn by yourself, yes. Okay, and you have to be confirmed that I mean the, 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 the that does not comes from any other uh, researcher's idea. Then definitely you can write the editors. You have that. Uh, yeah, idea. yeah. Because th that was the actual setup that we have only. I mean, we have only in our experimental setup. So that's good. That but, is what that, but keep it in mind when you will write to the editors, you have to keep it in mind that you you should have. Yes, this is yours. Okay, okay, got it. You you can. Know but yeah, I have the, I have the chance to claim it for myself, right? Yes, definitely, definitely. Even Thank if you, you can you. prove it, even if you can prove it, if the uh, other series that you are mentioned, if their articles have been published, still, I mean, the, uh, there is a chance uh, they, they will be forced to withdraw that paper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, you're welcome. Any more question, please? Oh, I, I am saying, uh, Dr. Uh, Prakash, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank Hello. you for a very comprehensive, uh, thank you for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, it covered uh, many topics, many, many uh, ways uh, by which one can violate the ethics. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Uh, I just wanted to add one, Another thing which I came across recently, mm -hmm. uh, one example actually, like another example, maybe it's a useful example for the yeah, community yes. who are concerned about ethics. Like the pharmaceutical, it is related to pharmaceutical companies and their claims. Mm -hmm. So as we know, there are these small prints and all that. So one thing what I came across some time back, mm -hmm. for example, statins, the effect of statins. Mm -hmm. So uh, people who uh, who took uh, uh, statins, uh, the stroke or um, heart attack or something that that, that I, I I have forgotten, but just mm -hmm. as an example, mm -hmm. uh, is three uh, percent, right? Mm -hmm. And then by taking statins, the stroke uh, or heart attack possibility reduces to one point five percent, right? Okay. So basically, if you look at absolute terms. It's a very small change from 3% to 1.5%, right? Mm. Yeah. But the way in which they advertise, the pharmaceutical company advertises, is that the, the status, uh, statin improves, um, the, the, the reduces the possibility of uh, heart, attack heart attack by 50%. Mm -hmm. right? Oh my goodness. So you look, you look at this. So 50%, so it's factually correct. Because mm. three percent has reduced to one point five percent, but in absolute terms, from hundred percent to you have 50%. come from three percent to one point five percent. So they are not talking about the absolute terms, right? So right. how do you how do you uh, in in what category you put this is mis misrepresentation of data? It's but legally, yeah, exactly. if you sue them, it is not misrepresentation. They are sort of telling that three percent has reduced to one point five percent, so public gets excited. Oh. Mm. There's a great opportunity here. So, uh, how do you um, um, stop this, or in what category does it come? Data misrepresentation. Yeah, data manipulation. We call it the data manipulations, or the we can you can say that the data actually this is the data falsification. Yeah. Okay. Data falsification. Thank you. Yes. 
Yes. Interesting. Thank you very much. It's really interesting. The reduce reduction from three to one point five, but they are. Uh, I mean the published. Uh, I mean the circulating the fifty percent. I'm the considering the hundred sample. Yeah, <laughs> that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I have one question regarding authorship. Uh, Please. So the question is like, in which case first author can be a corresponding author, and uh, like how to distinguish first author and corresponding author. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pate. So uh, basically, the uh, first, uh, first, uh, uh, I would like to define the who will be the corresponding authors. Corresponding authors means the actual the lead authors. Okay. Lead authors means that if you have the five uh, uh, co-authors, that means the corresponding author is the leader. That means if something happened to the papers. Who will take the responsibility? Okay. Yes. Who will take the responsibility? Say, as for example, the the widow. Say, uh, we are discussing some issues, right? So, someone claiming and someone, uh, I mean, the, or uh, something happened, right? So, who will take the responsibility? The, that is, he is he or she is the corresponding author, meaning that the senior uh, researcher of the group or the leader of the group should be the corresponding authors. Now, come to the uh, first author, okay? So first author, usually uh, 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 it depends actually. It depends, so it will be the first author. But for your case, I believe that the PhD students, when you collect the data and you make the first draft, you should be the, I mean, the PhD student should be the first authors, okay? But in some cases, as for example, for me, when I started my PhD, you know, that if your supervisor is not the tenured or he, he or she is the assistant professor, maybe he or she also required some first authorship for his promotion or her promotions, okay? So in that case, he can tell you, okay, until three, since he's your, uh, I mean, the mentors or the supervisors, okay? And he's providing you the facilities and the, everything. Actually, your data belongs to, I mean, the right, I mean, the, uh, what do you call it, the right, right? Right ship actually goes to his or her, whatever the data you uh, generate or you produce, okay? So in that case, he can tell you, okay, uh, 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 Mr. Pate, uh, three papers, you will be the first author and rest of the papers, I'll be the first authors. But if your supervisor is the professor, uh, he doesn't have any headache uh, uh, regarding the first authorship or blah, 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 okay? So um, uh, in that case, maybe, uh, by default, you'll be the first authors, okay? But yeah. for me, as for example, sometimes what happens? The My students conducted the research, collected the data, all the experiments he or she done, but then they, they, they maybe they switch to the industry. They, they are not a, any more eager for the publications, okay? Then I have to draft the manuscript, okay? I have to organize the manuscript. In that case, uh, I uh, uh, I will be the first author, as for example. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you for clearing the doubt. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I have a quick question. Uh, Please. You know, Catherine. discussing about ethics. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. I was thinking whether there, you found any correlation with what the institutions set as the minimum required, let's say, for people that are going towards tenure. So how much is the education industry driving those, that, let's say, looseness in ethics? Because if you push people to publish more, they mm -hmm. become more, I don't know, more prone to the idea of cheating Yes. rather than staying and say, hey, I, I've been working on a paper for four years, but it's an mm -hmm. important paper, mm -hmm. but I don't have 10 publications. So have you found any correlation between institutions and those cases that you mentioned on whatever requirements they pose and how strict they are, forcing pretty much whoever is underneath them and tries to satisfy those boxes to be prone to cheating? and loosening, loosening up their ethics because of that. Prof. Misty, would you please say something in this case? Uh, Katrina, you've raised a very important point. 
let me tell you where I come from. I don't. I, I think we become too number oriented. We should get rid of numbers. I'm a lone voice in the wilderness. What I would like to see is five papers being submitted for promotion. That's it. Uh, how many uh, extra were done? I'm not interested in that. I'm going to look at those five papers. When I get 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 uh, 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 to write a letter of recommendation, I read three of those papers, three out of the five papers. If I don't know the area, I will study that area. I will read the references. And I will come to my own conclusion in terms of what is scholarly or what is not about it and write about it. So, so there are some institutions that have this attitude. For example, at MIT, uh, papers, uh, the number of papers is not important. It is what has been turned in and uh, the comments that they ask you on those papers itself. And they, they expect you to do a very thorough job when you review those papers. So that's where I come from. Now, having been a department chair, uh, and, I, I, and, and I send these things out to other reviewers, uh, I get back uh, letters which I think are just cut and paste. The person has written so many papers, so many this, so much that, brought in so much money, done this sort of stuff. Guess what? Promote the guy. I don't buy that. I mean, those are lousy letters. And these are not, uh, these, these letters are written not just by young people or people I respect. They write these sorts of letters. So I think the professorate, particularly in the United States, uh, is to blame. We are to blame. And, and what I would suggest very strongly is that when you are in a position uh, to affect things, you let people know that that's how you're going to be doing that. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree on that. I, I'm, I'm starting to see something that I don't like in academia, especially, like you said, in the States, Mm -hmm. uh, that's focusing a lot on numbers. And then there is a fine line between people that want to break those ethics and people that are not willing to do that. And I feel that, you know, this line is getting pushed every year more and more towards people trying to make their way through, mm -hmm. just focusing at the goal without understanding the consequences entirely. Right. So one of the things I'd advise you to do is when you write your three pages up in terms of research, et cetera, uh, be very careful about it because people like me read it very carefully. And that's the way you get around the number of papers by showing that you are a deep thinker and that what you've done is the past and that the thing that you've done in the past is foundational to your future and the future is, looks bright. So that's how you make it out. You don't worry about the papers. Thank you so much. Thank Any you. more questions, please? I mean, I don't have a question, but um, another interesting, uh, it's not academic, but it is uh, uh, research really? malpractice. Yeah, okay. it's a research malpractice thing. I don't know if you have heard. There was a scientist from uh, Bell Labs uh, mm -hmm. he was he was around 30 or 31 he was trying to become the youngest to get a nobel prize mm -hmm. he was working on organic uh, <clears throat> organic switches those organic transistors basic his okay. name is jan hendrik schoen mm -hmm. and uh, it's a it's a pretty famous one where <clears throat> yeah we uh, like hear his name yeah yeah, he was, uh, I think his output was like he was publishing a paper every three days or something like that was his uh, oh output. <laughs> and uh, the things that he has done is pretty amazing in terms of like, it is so bad that it is so good kind of a thing. Mm. And uh, yeah, he was he was there working at Bell Labs. And uh, there's a very nice three part video on YouTube. Uh, there's this guy who did it. He's also a physicist who covered this story and yeah, I but think every three days really... one research article is actually that was yeah the, on an average that was that was his output yeah so mm -hmm. yeah if, okay if he has the huge I mean let's say fifty PhD students or thirty no. PhD students then it can happen I, I will I will put the name of the scientist in the chat it the story is very amazing I think okay. any uh if you are interested in things like this uh, that okay, okay, please, kind please, of interested please. in yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. But yeah, I did. And 
yeah that's how i just wanted to add it that i have i have uh, gone through his story and it's pretty amazing how things mm -hmm. work out mm -hmm. thank you any more question That's it. Okay, thank yes. you everybody. I'm not sure uh, how thank much, you. Uh, uh, I mean, the uh, benefit <laughs> you will get from this uh, webinar. However, uh, I'm open to discuss with you if uh, any of you need any discussion with me. I am here in the engineering lab. My room number is 141. So please come uh, uh, and knock me. Uh, I'll be happy to, to discuss with you in ethical issues and research. Thank you so much. So, um, I, on behalf of the graduate student community for GCOE, I want to thank you for an extremely insightful and thought-provoking provoking lecture. And you have sensed that from things that have come up in the chat and also uh, in the sorts of questions that you have raised. I think this is a very important issue, uh, not just for students, but also for faculty uh, yes. in terms of uh, how they establish their professional identities, because this goes down to what you think of yourself. So with mm -hmm. that, thank you all very much for joining. And thank mm -hmm. you, Abu, for a lovely presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.